Exodus 32. In February and March 1836, there was a group of men and a handful of women who were held up at a little fort in San Antonio, Texas. You know the name of that fort? A little fort that got popular in 1836? The Alamo, yeah. They were fighting against the Mexicans. The Mexicans, Texas was vying for statehood, but Santa Ana was the Mexican general who was trying to make sure that it remained in Mexican power. They were badly outnumbered. They were running short of supplies. And the commander of the fort was a man named William Travis. When, when all was lost and when it was very apparent that we're not going to get out of this alive, William Travis took uh, his sword and he called all of the men together out in the, the courtyard area. And according to the stories that we, that we have, he took his sword and he drew a line in the sand. And he declared his intention to stay and fight to the end, knowing that he wouldn't make it out, but hoping that some reinforcements would come. He gave all of the men the option to leave if they felt that the cause was not worth the risk. And according to the history that we have, only one man <laughs> took him up on it. All the rest, and some of, of note, Jim Bowie was one of those. He was, he was sick, and he had to be carried across on his bed. Davy Crockett and a group of Tennessee men came across the line as well. And eventually, all but the one came across. And they crossed that line in the sand. The rest of them decided to defend the fort. The Mexican army attacked in overwhelming numbers just before dawn on March 6th. And all of the men who defended the Alamo died. A uh, couple of women survived. None of the men. Look here at Exodus 32. That's, the, that's where we get the, the phrase... A line in the sand. In the sand, you've heard that. Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from most most recently. And here we come to Exodus 32, and we see another instance of a choice given to a group of people with very important consequences to follow. Take a look at chapter 32 and tell me what's going on in in the story. Ten Commandments. Moses is up on the mountain. Idol worship. Idol worship. Yeah. Down in the valley, Aaron, you remember what he said? He, they, they said, we don't know what's become of Moses. So they told Aaron, we want you to make us a god. And so Aaron caved and he said, well, give me all of your, give me all of your earrings and, and all of your gold. And they gave it to him. And, and he, the, the Bible specifically tells us that he fashioned it with a graving tool, meaning that he took time to fashion this, this calf. Well, Moses came down off of the mountain holding the Ten Commandments, one of them me saying, Thou shalt make no graven image. And number one saying, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And Moses comes down, and uh, as he makes his way down, he hears, he hears noise. Joshua was up on Mount Sinai just a little ways. And Joshua came to Moses and he said, there's war in the camp. And Moses said, it's not the noise of them who strive for mastery. It's not the noise of those who fight. It's, the, it's singing. <laughs> We're, they're having a party without us, Joshua. But he knew it was more than that. And he came down. He said, the people have corrupted themselves. And they come down and Moses takes and he breaks the, the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. God had cut out the tablets, and then God had written on them. And Moses took the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of stone, and he broke them. And he went to Aaron, and he said, Aaron, what, what in the world? <laughs> well, why would you do this? And Aaron said, well, Moses, what, what happened is they, they wanted a God, and I said, give me your gold, and I threw it into the fire, and a calf fell out. <laughs> and and obviously... We would expect that. I would expect that out of my eight-year-old. You know, well, that it just happened. No, it didn't just happen. That's what, like I said, the Bible specifically says he fashioned it with a graving tool. Well, now he's he's trying to back up and he says, well, you know, the people, 
The people wanted a god. Well, Moses takes the golden calf and he grinds it to powder. And he throws it on the water and he makes the people drink. And we come here to chapter 32, verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. That's where we get the song that we just sang. Who is on the Lord's side? Maybe Moses had a real deep voice, and that's why they wrote the song so long. <laughs> It says, and all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Moses is of the tribe of Levi, remember? So his tribe comes to him, and he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. So Moses gave them a choice. He said, Who's on the Lord's side? Now, Moses, he's, he's standing at the gate of the camp. Who is he addressing? Just the tribe of Levi? No, all the tribes, right? He says, Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. Only the tribe of Levi trickles over to him. What does it mean to be on the Lord's side in the day in which we live? What's, it look, what's that look like in 2021? What, what does it look like? Well, number one, there has to be a willingness to separate. That's not popular in the day in which we live. Look again at verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me, which means come away from the people you're standing with. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves unto him. The Levites were in the minority. They were, they would be at most one twelfth. Okay? If all of the tribes were equal, all of the tribes were not equal. So they're a little bit less, very likely, than one twelfth. One of them steps up to declare loyalty, not just to Moses. It's who is on it, Moses didn't stand up and say, Who's on my side? He said, Who's on the Lord's side? Levi came to him. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Separation makes us uncomfortable. It has since we were kids, doesn't it? When you, when you tell your kids, your kids ever come, and they say, I want to do this, because all my friends are, you say, well, we don't do that because, because the Bible says no. And, and it's, a, it's a struggle, because... Even if you have a young person who wants to serve the Lord, they, they love the Lord, you know, they trusted the Lord as their personal Savior, they want to do right, it's still difficult because all my friends are doing it. I don't want to be the different one. I don't want to be odd. And that, that magically goes away when you turn 18, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. As adults, we don't like to be the odd one out. We don't like to be the one who has to step away from the group when, when everybody, and it's it does change flavors a little bit. You, you don't, we don't have a lot of the same temptations of peer pressure that teenagers do. Because I, I hope you're busy doing other things. That teenage, Teenagers have lots of extra time. As adults, we have less. And so there's not quite the pull to, to you know, smoke cigarettes behind the bleacher at the football game. You know, that's, not, that's probably not the temptation that, that gets pushed onto us. But the call to be different, the call to be, to, to have a testimony at work, the call to be different when you're, when you're around a group of people who you've known for a long time, who you grew up with, the call to be different, it, it still kind of makes us, makes us uncomfortable. We crave acceptance, and often it would seem that the best way to be accepted is to extend acceptance, especially in this day and age in which we live. I, I, don't, I don't endorse what they do. They're wrong. They're living in sin. But I accept them because I want them to accept me back. It, it's not what God says. God says, come out from among them. Be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. We want to fit in with others. So rather than stand up for the name of Christ, we simply sometimes go along to get along. I don't want to make waves. I don't, I don't want to be that... I don't want to be the one person at work 
who says something. I, you know, everybody laughs at so-and-so's jokes. I know they're not funny. I know that they're blasphemous. But I'm not going to say anything because if I say something, people will think I'm different. And the Bible says that we are supposed to be a peculiar people, doesn't it? Not, not weird. The Bible doesn't use that word. It says be peculiar, meaning be distinctively different. And we're supposed to be distinctly different. We're, we're not supposed to be, to be odd in, in just as the goal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just be weird. That, that would be easier than being separate, wouldn't it? It would be a whole lot easier. I mean, you could wear a beanie with a propeller on top, and you would be different, okay? And, and you'd, you'd probably ended up, end up getting separated because nobody would want to be near the adult with a beanie on his head, okay? But that's not what God has called us to do. We're not to be different because we're weird. We're to be different because we're, we're caring about what God has to say. That's what set apart the Levites in this day. So number one, they're willing to separate. Number two... They're willing to show loyalty. Look at verse 27. And he, Moses, said unto them, the Levites, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every one his brother, every man his companion, every man his neighbor. The children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell, at the fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Well, that's pretty intense, isn't it? To... That's, that's the call. Moses' command for the Levites was to go out and kill those who had defiled themselves. Not everyone who had involved themselves in idolatry. Probably, this is referring to those who had involved themselves in the immorality. Because there were those, it, they had turned it into just an orgy down at the bottom of the mountain. As the people, they're not just breaking God's commands against idolatry. They're committing adultery. They're committing fornication. It's just, a, it's a nasty setting. And so Moses said, get your sword. Let's clean house. And so they weighed in and, and they, they, they kill a lot. 3,000 people. By the way, interpreting scripture in light of its context, this is not God's command for us today. There are some who, given the events of the day, say, it's time. Let's, let's, we probably don't, wouldn't take our sword. I'm going to take my gun. We're going to go. We're going to clean house. That's not what this passage is saying. How do we show loyalty to God? If not by taking our sword and going to our neighbor's house, how do we, how do we show loyalty to God in 2021? It's going to look different. Ezekiel 22 verse 30 says, and I sought for a man among them. That would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me and for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Meaning God was looking down from heaven at a land that had defiled itself and a population that had defiled itself. And he was looking for a man, looking for a woman who would stand in the gap and make up the spiritual difference. Somebody who would stand in the gap and, and be a voice for God. But in, in Ezekiel, he didn't find anyone. And that's still what God's looking for today. God's still looking for people who will stand up and make a bigger deal about their relationship with God than their political opinions. God's still looking for people who will do this. God, God's looking for people who are willing to be different than those who are around them. If you take God seriously and if you do your best to live according to God's word, you're going to look different than the people around you who aren't. That's just the fact of the matter. You can't possibly live in accordance with God's word and go along with the crowd. You'll stand out. You, you must. One of the reasons in the, in the Old Testament, when we read how the Jews were to dress, the reason God told them, I want you to wear these, these fringes under your garment. I don't want you to round the corners of your beard. I want you to wear these particular clothes. The reason for that was so they'd stand out. God wanted his people, when you're walking through a crowd, you should be able to. If you were looking for somebody who's keeping Levitical law, you'd be able to say, there's a Jew. There's another one. And there's another one. Not everybody. They stand out. And God's looking for people now. We talked about it on Sunday. God's purpose for his church is to be his example to the rest of the world now. Which means that we're going to stand out. He says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. If we're living according to God's word, we're loving one another, and we're loving our neighbor as ourselves. 
We're going to stand out. We'll look different. God's still looking for people who are willing to go against the culture of sin around them. When sin gets popular, it is popular right now. Since sin is popular, God's looking for people who will stand against it. God's looking for people who are willing to take their walk with God seriously. We, we need to. The hour is late. The day is dark. And God's looking for people like you and me to take our relationship with him very seriously. Right now, in 2021, if you watch the inauguration this, this morning, or you've just been watching politics in the last couple of months, you probably feel like there's really not just a ton that I can personally do right now. And, and politically speaking, there's probably not. You write your congressman, you know, be, be involved, but the best thing, the most important thing that you can do is be a Christian who loves God, who stands out from the crowd, and who is distinctly different from the rest of the world. Because there's a whole host of people right now who are walking around and they have, they have decided that, that since their guy's in the White House, everything's better. And it's not. And, and truth be told, if Donald Trump had won in November, it, it wouldn't be better. Okay? The problem is that we need men and women who are willing to stand out. Men and women who are willing to take their walk with God seriously. People who are willing to speak up and publicly defend the honor of God. When they hear that it's being torn down, when somebody brings God into the conversation in a bad way, don't, don't let them get away with it. You wouldn't let them, you, you, I hope you wouldn't let them talk that way about your spouse or your loved one. Why would you let them talk that way about your Savior? You know, step up, stand up and say, look, let's, why, why don't, if you're looking for a name to say, why don't you just say my name? But let's leave God out of it because God says don't. It, don't, don't, don't be needlessly offensive, but stand up for the honor of God. Stand up in such a way. God's looking for people who will show loyalty in that way. One reason is because there's no third option. When Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? He, he didn't say, and if you just want to be left alone, then you can go over here. It wasn't who's on the Lord's side, come to me. Who's on, who's on you know, the, the idolater side, let them go over here. And the third party. There's no third party when it comes to God or the world. Matthew 6.24 says, no man can serve two masters. I think I've told you that's where the Bible outlaws polygamy, right there. Man could, shouldn't <laughs> marry two wives. Uh, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Right? So you're either on God's side or you're on the world's side. You're, you're either for Christ or you are against Christ by, by default. The default position is not to be able to be your own master. You're free to choose which master you'll serve, but not free to be without a master. You're not free to be your own master. In a day when our culture is sprinting into darkness, and we are, a lot of the uh, executive orders that have been signed this afternoon have hastened our march into darkness as, as a culture, as a society. And in a day when our culture is sprinting towards darkness, God's looking for people who will step up, step forward, and publicly defend the cause of Christ. More than you'll defend your political candidate. Be willing to defend the cause of Christ. That's the first and foremost. I'm willing to share my political opinions. I enjoy sharing my political opinions. But I should also be willing and, and I should be desirous of sharing what God has done for me and what God can do for others. So the question, who's on the Lord's side? The question still comes. In the case of the tribe of Levi, what was their reward? They lived, yeah. They were they weren't among those who were being killed, but they became the priests. Yeah. They became the priests. Levi's Levites, right? Yep. They became the priests. Were yep. they at that point? Well, at that point there wasn't the priest because Moses was coming down and they would establish who the who the high priest and stuff was. But I think it has much to do with the fact that they were willing to stand up for the cause of Christ. What uh, 
I was trying to think, what was Aaron? Aaron was a Levite. What was he then? Was he something to Moses, wasn't he? The brother. The brother. Older yeah, brother. So that. <laughs> yeah. Interesting that God God gave I showed that's mercy. What it was, but I thought, well, gosh, right? maybe that. I, which gives me, time. which gives me a little bit more reason to say I don't think that they killed everybody who was involved in idolatry. I think they killed those who were involved in uncleanness and in the immorality. Because certainly, if you're just looking for people who were involved in idolatry, then Aaron would be high up on the list because he enabled. Yeah. yeah. But he's the one that made the calf. He would be the. Yep, he was the, the enabler <laughs> yeah. behind it. So, yeah. But God showed mercy, and, and God, God allowed Aaron to go on and become the high priest of the nation of Israel. Aaron was the one who stood, Aaron was the one who stood before God for the people. And uh, he was a man who would have had a lot of humility added as a result of this instance. So be on the Lord's side. That's what the world needs right now in 2021.